There we go. Now we're good. Now we're good. All right. So I guess we'll get started. Uh, my name is Joe Wayulo. I'm curator, co-founder of the Long Island Aquarium. It's out in Riverhead, New York, on the east end of Long Island. It's our 22nd year of operation since uh, we opened the aquarium. When we did open the aquarium, uh, the reef tank at the time was uh, the largest in this hemisphere and second largest in the world. Uh, it's, it still ranks about third in the country as far as gallonage, and we're going to talk today about the history of the tank, and I'm not crying here because I'm at Aquashella. Um, it was uh, rebooting and taking down the tank, uh, which was quite a, I'm going to go through the whole process of how that came about and why that happened, and so um, you can always count on Sanjay for... Uh, loving support. So one of, one of my posts, I had posts about speaking at Macna, and he, of course, has to fire away with the, you had to trash a 10,000 gallon tank to get in the lineup. So, so his, yeah, so that was a lot of fun. Um, this is not a recent shot. This was setting up the tank about 20, almost 23 years ago. There's 30,000 pounds of a quarried limestone rock base to it, and 10,000 pounds of live rock on the inside. Uh, this was the tank when it was pretty, this is just the left side of the tank. So there's an east side and west side of a tank. So that's when you know you have a pretty big tank if you're, you talk about an east and west side. And, um, you know, it had grown in very good through the years. Uh, but then things happen. And I'm just going to read this, um, or I'm just going to paraphrase this. So the tank was struggling a little bit. And um, I do some photography, and I was waiting for an owl to show up in the middle of the winter in the dunes. And I texted my good friend Bob Stark from ESV and told him that I was going to reset the tank. And um, he basically, the only thing he could muster was a thumbs up response because of the, the, the amount of work it was going to be. So this is the start of the takedown of the tank. Um, so basically what was done in um, a, a series of events was removing all the upper corals from the tank. So a lot of the upper corals here have been removed and then worked my way down the tank and brought the other corals up. Uh, here's just some more of the uh, situation. And again, I'm going to talk into why this, why this actually took place. Uh, so here, like you can see, the corals are moving slowly, working their way up. There's nothing now on the front ledge that I wanted to keep as far as uh, corals. I mean, every coral came out, of course. Um, this is a top-down view. So this tank has 26,000 watts of light on it. And this is the wet side or the right side of the tank. And here, all the live rock that you see piled up, a lot of that used to be down in the sand. Uh, working its way up the reef, and I knew as we were taking the tank down, I'd, I wanted as few obstructions in the bottom of the tank, so when we wanted to catch some of the fish out, there wouldn't be any rock on the bottom. Everything would be on uh, these, the elevated live, uh, branch rock and stuff. So a lot of critters to remove from the tank, long spine urchins. Again, here's removing some of the corals from the surface using uh, long grabbers. A lot of fish removal. Um, some of the fish removal was done by just dip netting the fish when they were chasing floating pellets and things. Others were removed um, during night dives, collecting them at night. And then some of these guys were also, if you want to catch a fish, it works on your home tank too, where you can just, uh, when you go in the middle of the night when your tank is completely dark and put on every light possible, the fish kind of wake up in a stupor and can't really see what's going on and come out of the rock and they'll, they'll bump around into things kind of like stumbling to the bathroom maybe late at night and you just can't figure out where you're going. So the fish wake up in that mode and you can just dip net them out of the tank. So it works on a, a lot of different size tanks. Um, here's removing some more acropora, um, some soft corals. They don't move fast so you can net them. Same thing with the clams. Uh, they were, some of them were netted out. Uh, these are the Heteractus magnifica anemones. Uh, um, started with one in this tank, and um, the top ridge ended up having about uh, 18 or 19. They had been splitting through the years and growing. Uh, so a lot of that, I didn't want to remove a lot of the rock with it. So a lot of those were, 
if I couldn't peel them off easily, then I just chipped the rock away from the base of the uh, anemones. So there's a, there are some that are on the top ridge there on the, on the left side. Those were then placed into buckets in the tank and then lifted out. And so here's a whole bunch of Heteractus magnifica anemones. And this is um, part of the process, a lot of diving in the tank, just to give you some of the scale of what was involved. Uh, that Gorgonia is, uh, will be 32 years old this year. Here's um, an urchin when I was diving in the tank. I had put him in the bucket. And here I am working on the other side, uh, chipping out and removing some corals. And I'm not realizing that uh, the urchin is making his, his great escape. And the length of the video is kind of long, so I'm, I'm not going to do the whole thing. But he, he, he does get out of the bucket. Um, so some of the corals were pretty easily removed. Other ones that had been growing in for many years had to be chipped out with a hammer and chisel. Uh, there's uh, removing some of the gorgonia. This is me coming back after removing some corals and then looking in the bucket and realizing that the bucket's empty. And uh, yeah, so yeah, had to, had to go find. So you got to have fun, right? You got to have fun with everything that you do, even if, even if it kind of sucks. Just try and have fun with, uh, with what you're doing. So of course, carefully handling, not touching long spine urchins, just gently getting them back in the bucket. And uh, yeah, he's a wise guy. Um, Heteractus magnificent anemones make an awesome hat. Um, if you're wondering, you, you can cry underwater. You can. It was, this was a very emotional thing. This tank had been my partner for 22 years. And then to be taken apart was, uh, was um, quite, quite trying. But so. The, the tank had been having some issues for a while, and you know, you're putting Band-Aids on things. Uh, so the, going back to the story about sitting in the dunes waiting for this owl to show up, um, clearly I wasn't actively thinking about what I was gonna do with the tank, but it, my brain was thinking about it at some, some level, and it just came to me. It was just like, okay, it's time for you to redo the tank. And that was it. And all the pain and anxiety went away, all the stress of what, it was like, I don't know, or, oh, you know, if you have a religious experience or not, or just a very cathartic, it was just a cleansing, and all this anxiety and stress and strain went away, and then it was just a matter of figuring out how to do it. But it was a neat moment of clarity, which was, uh, which, which, which was a great thing. Uh, there were many late nights working on the tank, so our catering department uh, that we have at the aquarium kept me well fed, which was good. <clears throat> So we have a tank full of corals, they gotta go somewhere. Uh, so this is a, a 12 foot diameter, uh, one of our holding tanks that we use for multiple things and I set this up for corals. Um, you can see the max spec LEDs uh, supporting this tank. I have some of them on the main reef tank as well. A lot of the Gorgonia, I didn't want the rock that they were on and also that was taking up a lot of space. So a lot of them were just hung on ropes in that tank. Uh, this is the Abyss uh, 400 um, that Alex donated to us. This is an amazing pump and was used for a lot of the circulation in this uh, tank for holding the corals. So like I was saying earlier, when I was moving all the uh, live rock and the corals from the bottom up, all the branch rock and everything that you see here used to come down into the sand, but all of that was lifted up onto the reef structure. So the, the 30,000 pounds of quarried limestone, you can see some of it here, these big slabs uh, that were, are the main reef structure. And just for reference, those, that, that rock is really dense. It's, it's a fossilized uh, rock from Wisconsin when there used to be an ocean there. It weighs 150 pounds per cubic foot. And this was the day of uh, no return. So. Um, I ended up doing it on June 6th, and for any of you that know about World War II, that's D-Day. Um, so that was, uh, the timing worked out, and it was, it was picked to be June 6th. Uh, so what I did prior to breaking the tank down was, I, I said reset the photo period so that the, 
the uh, lights would come on very early in the morning, so the fish would wake up earlier. I was going in earlier and feeding them and keeping them out of the rock work. So on the day of the drop, they were, they were used to getting up earlier. And then while we were dropping the tank, we were trying to keep as many fish out of the reef structure as possible. So they were being fed a little bit while the tank was going down. And that's the point of a, a no return. And then this is what you're left with. Um, you can see some of the staff. I think, um, I think Noel is back there and Teddy. So the, the, the crew was tremendous in helping out uh, with, with the system. So here we lowered the water level down. Oh, and then also before I lowered the tank, uh, before we lowered the water out when I was diving, I dug areas of sand out to make kind of like internal ponds. So as the water level went down, they would puddle up in those areas. So that worked out pretty well for getting some of the fish out. And there's Noel looking around. Yeah, and now you have 20,000 gallon tank worth of live rock and sand and now what do you do with it? So it, to me, as, as I was piling everything up, it really started looking... Joanne, Joanne. Hello? Can you come up to the stage, please? Joanne, if you hear this, come up to the stage area. Okay. The contest stage. All right. There we go. So um, it kind of looked like if you ever saw pictures of a reef that's been hit by a monsoon, where the corals and rock and everything is just tossed and tossed about and then it resettles and then everything grows back again. I was like, oh, that's kind of what this is looking like. So um, that was with the rock uh, setting up. So here the tank was then um, refilled with uh, fresh water and then uh, 15 gallons of bleach, concentrated bleach. And on the audio of this video, there's a there's a a a, a, a -ha 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 kind of laugh going on as I poured the bleach in. Uh, so here's 20,000 gallons of freshwater bleached tank with everything out that I wanted to get out. So this is a tank was 21 years old and running. Um, so there was a lot of things to deal with that contributed to redoing this tank. Um, some of it was just around certain areas of the tank. We're dealing with salt water. There was some rust issues, so it was time to take care of them. There were certain areas, of course, that were just being held together with duct tape and zip ties. Time to address those things as well. So you can see some of the damage that was done to the, to the platform. It's salt water. It's brutal. Um, so that was all sealed back up again, primed, and then several coats. And then, it, I don't have a picture of it, but this is all now encased in uh, polyethylene sheet material, so the salt water can, can't even get to it anymore. These are um, some four inch pipes that are going through the cement wall and there's a link seal kind of fitting that keeps the water from uh, um, leaving the tank. It was leaking a little bit and they rely on tightening screws to squeeze the gasket down, but you don't turn 22 year old screws tighter. Um, so what I did was backfilled uh, the, the penetrations on the tank with expansion foam, carved that back down, and then resealed it with 795 silicone. So there was a lot of just little things that needed to get done. So some of the major reasons why the tank was taken down, um, Asterina stars. So there's no absolutes in anything. <laughs> I don't know if that, that's a pretty interesting sentence, but... Um, so no, I'm not saying all Asterinas are bad. A lot of them are very good, but there are some that uh, will eat your corals. And my population in the tank had gotten really huge through the years. So there was an Asterina concern. Now I'm not saying go home and kill all your Asterinas and things, but just be wary of, of them. Um, and it, it, sometimes it's just quantity of them that causes a problem. But I, I, did, I definitely wanted to deal with them. And you can't put Harlequin shrimp in a 20,000 gallon reef tank. Uh, there was another sponge that was growing in the tank, Callospongia. And I don't know anything that eats this. I've had big angels in the tank. I've had everything in the tank that would possibly eat a sponge. Nothing eats this stuff. And it was overgrowing a lot of things. You can peel it off. Um, but what it does also is it gets inside like your large colonies of corals and then grows on and suffocates stuff on the way out. 
So this was another big reason to uh, bleach the tank was to eliminate this sponge. These are the, I, don't, I forget the scientific name, the curly Q anemones, they're not aptasia. I, never, I didn't, have to have, didn't have an aptasia or Majano problem because of the fish that I had in the tank, but they wouldn't eat these guys. And uh, these became quite a pest in the tank as well. So this was another target that I was going for. Uh, the other main question in the tank, too, was running 20 years. What else is hiding among the rock through the years? And you hear these horror stories of different worms. And I didn't find many, but these guys were about 18 inches long and probably causing some issues. But the main reason I took the tank down were, was Palithoa. Um, so, again, no absolutes. There's good Palithoas that have very low toxic rates, and there's some that are just... It's this, I think it's the most lethal toxin that uh, nature creates. Um, and even I was getting sick in the tank sometimes. There was one day that I was diving in the tank and my, at the end of the dive, my mouth went, tasted fully metallic. I knew something was very wrong. And by the time I got home, it was like an instant flu and like constant like shaking and then cold and then heat and that went on for about three days from the palithoa toxin. So there was that um, concern and there were other issues with the palithoas. So I was having some fish losses in the system and these fish were perfectly healthy. We sent them out to different labs. Our in-house in pathology was showing nothing on these fish. Um, they, they shouldn't have been dead. That was the, the main thing that came back. And then one of the labs said, look into some type of toxic, it almost looks like they died from like a toxic event. So that led me to further think about the palithoas and them releasing and killing some of the fish. So the main reason the tank was taken down was, um, well, I didn't want to die. So that, that's, that's a good reason. Um, I didn't want anybody else getting sick who was taking care of the tank because I had other incidents where uh, just water dripped in my eye after diving in the tank and my eye blew up and yellow pus. It's, it's, so palitho is, I'm just saying be really careful because there's so many stories. One of the guys at work had gotten some for his nephew's birthday and just them handling that at the party, all seven of them got really sick that night from the palithoa toxin. And there's countless stories, and I'm amazed nobody's been sued yet for palithoas. But just, I would never put certain ones back in a, in a tank. So now the tank is empty. It's been bleached. It's time to remove the gravel and substrate that's accumulated through the years. So 257 buckets later, um, the sand was removed. So this all had to be uh, bucketed up, hauled up, hauled out. There's a shovel spade on the right side of the, of the image, and that's showing you in some of the areas where the, the sand had accumulated through the years. Uh, that's, but you can see it's still pretty clean, but it was, very, it was like shoveling, setting cement filled with shards of acropora branches and just all the different corals through the years. It was, it was pretty intense. Um, so here's, it's getting better and redoing some of the rock work. Um, that's the bottom of the tank. So this tank was initially sprayed with a polyurea lining, kind of similar to what you'd spray the, your uh, pickup truck beds with. Uh, so I was very fortunate that there were no issues when I did drop the tank as far as uh, the integrity of the tank, which is pretty amazing after 22 years. But that's the, that's the uh, tank bottom there. So there's some of the quarried limestone with the, with the live rock removed. So this was done 22 years ago. So there was a few things that I was like, oh man, I wish I had done just a little bit different. And this gave me the opportunity to move some of that rock around, open things up a little bit more. And again, just keeping in mind, it's 150 pounds per cubic foot. So it's, it's a pretty heavy rock. This is the side wall of the tank that had initially just been a, a bare wall and then it was uh, built up to have a lot of rock, ended up accumulating over there through the years and building up a reef wall. Um, so I wanted to modify that a little bit, push things back. So um, took the, live, the rock that was in the tank, hammer drilled it, 
and then put inserted the um, fiberglass rods to make up the, the sidewall of the, of the reef tank. So there you can see some of the, the rock on the right side. And then it was just shuffling a lot of the rock around and moving rock and back and forth and hosing down constantly to get rid of stuff. And there's no bottom drain in here, so you'd have to vacuum up the water. And then the wet vac would fill up, and then you'd open the top and put a sump pump in that and pump that water out. I can't even tell you how many times that was done. Uh, so this is the side wall with the fiberglass rod going through the rock. This works out great in any size tank. Um, a lot of this, some of this was uh, original live rock and a, and a number of it was uh, Marco rock. And now things are starting to take shape. So, so again, this is a public aquarium. This isn't in your basement. So uh, at different times we had the, the windows open so the public could watch and see what the project was going on. But, so this whole side, I was able to open up the right side a lot and make the, make the lagoon a lot bigger. Uh, and then one night I was working, it was my birthday. So we started June 6th and we're a public aquarium. So I, my, my, my timeline was three weeks to have this tank full of water with some fish and some corals uh, by July 2nd. So that's my middle son on the right. He lives in California now. He surprised me. He flew home for my birthday. That's my youngest son behind him. So they found me at, at work and got me out of the tank and we went and got dinner. And I was telling them a story about earlier when I was carrying some stuff, I guess I was a little tired, a little fatigued. And I actually tripped and realized that I was falling. Like I was falling into the tank and like I was, whatever I was carrying, I just threw that. And then when I came to, not that I blacked out, but like when I consciously became aware of what, where I was, I was hanging from the walkway like this. So I was telling them the story and of course my sons are like, oh, you gotta show us dad. So not, not the actual fall, but just, so they had me, so yeah. Luckily my reflexes are still pretty good, but I don't remember getting like this. I just remember realizing, dude, you're falling into the tank. Um, so they, yeah, so they had me reenact it, so. So my birth date was almost my death date. It was pretty, that was pretty intense also. I did uh, open up my knee pretty good, but you know, you just band-aids and duct tape and keep working. This is a total view of the tank. You can see a lot of live rock uh, from the tank that's up on the, the walkways. So another thing to get done while we're working on the tank, while it's down, is acrylics get scratched over time. There's no way around it. Uh, and you can see the fine scratches in here just from years of cleaning. So I have polished these, this tank underwater about four or five times through the years to get rid of the scratches using pneumatic sanders. And it's pretty intense. It's a lot of diving, but it's a lot easier to do when the tank is empty. So we took advantage of doing that. So here's the tank. Again, it's 30 feet long. It's 14 feet front to back and about six and a half feet deep. And you put up a grid pattern and, and then you start sanding. And you have to make it worse before it gets better. And it's pretty horrifying, it's for, especially the first time you do this, or the first time anybody who's not aware of what you're doing comes in and then sees your, your acrylics this hazy. But you've got to sand out all the scratches and then work your way back up with finer and finer uh, sandpaper, basically. Uh, so here's a, a portion of like one window that was done, but you can see how hazy you have to sand that acrylic down. And here's just a little video of towards the end, um, you end up using about five different grits of sandpaper to make this happen. And you've got to do eight passes with each grit. So it, it takes a long time, but it's worth it. All right, so yeah, so now you have a brand new piece of acrylic, which is pretty good. Uh, again, spraying the rock down, getting rid of as much detritus and things, and that, that having to get vacuum that up and send it out. Um, the staff was very helpful on a lot of different areas. Uh, this is just hauling out. That's a, um, just buckets of gravel and sand that was discarded. I did remove three pallets of rock from the tank to open things up a little bit more. And now that some of the final rock work is starting to happen. Here's a top view. This is looking down from the protein skimmer. Um, so kind of shows you the finished project 
of, of the rock. So this is on the east side, the left side of the tank. And you can see some old ac um, acro colonies, some stylophores that had grown huge through the years. Those were fragged before the tank was taken down. And I left the skeletons in there to bleach them out. So a lot of that stuff I just turned upside down so it looked like, uh, well, I called it Monsoon Joe went through and just leveled this reef and tossed everything around and then that's where, how it landed. Uh, this is looking at the right side of the tank. So you can see the rock work on the right side with the uh, fiberglass rod through it. So he's able to really open things up. Um, a whole bunch of sand. Julian sent me about 2,000 pounds of sand for the tank. This is for Ben Johnson. He was horrified at this photo. Uh, it didn't have his name on it beforehand, but he was horrified that I was just using airline tubing to tie off something. So I named it uh, Johnson's Tea just to add some fuel to the fire. This is the overflow from the tank that used to go, that did go to the sump. I did keep the, a lot of the tanks above the reef uh, actively running, um, but I didn't want any bad water getting from the reef tank to the sump that would kill everything. And there was only one way to really make sure that that happened, and that was to just cut that pipe in case somebody opened a wrong valve and overflowed bleach water into the system. So that this is one 100% effective way of making sure water doesn't get where you want it to go. That was glued back together. Again, there were tanks everywhere in the aquarium holding corals and clams, and these uh, the Phillips Coral Care Gen 2s uh, were, were donated to us for the project, which was, they were very helpful and, a, and an amazing light. Here's a whole, this is like a six foot uh, diameter tub of the Hateractus Magnifica anemones being held. And um, other coral troughs were set up, the Illumagic from Unique Corals. So this was a good day. This was filling the tank with salt water. Um, again, we're doing this on public display. So here you can see that uh, as the water fills up your tank, the optics change drastically as to when you see your tank dry versus when it's full. So if you look like below the water level here, you see how much bigger everything looks and how much closer everything looks. It jumps forward about 30%. So depending on how you want your tank to look, especially on a large scale, you've got to think about what it's going to look like full versus uh, empty. Uh, so you can see so in there again, um, so all that live rock, branch rock and stuff, that used to be down in the sand. I elevated that up, opened up the tank a lot more. So those stylos there were, um, some of those colonies, the skeletons were almost 50 pounds through the years that they had grown. This is again filling the tank up, nice clean acrylics. So we use natural seawater from Shinnecock Inlet. We truck it in, we have a big tanker truck, but it's low in everything reef related. So um, my good friend Bob over at ESV set me up with everything I needed to get the tank parameters where I wanted them. So there was actually a um, ammonia and nitrite, which I was expecting some, but not as much. But no matter how clean you got that rock, there was still a lot of like dead bacteria and worms and stuff deep in the rock. So I did grab a bunch of, um, uh, bio balls from our shark tank filtration and set up a bio tower to deal with that during the break-in period. Gathered critters from the tanks around the aquarium to help reseed it. So trying to get this tank up and running, again, it's on public display, and you have all the lighting and you have this huge tank full of sterile rock. Everything's sterile. I didn't want to put live rock back in and introduce any of the things I was concerned about. So it was really just like a, a kind of massaging this tank back to life and not putting too much light on. Uh, but again, it's on public display. We had notes on the, on, the, on the tank saying what was happening and why we were doing certain things. Uh, but so uh, a bunch of urchins were employed. Uh, you can see how quickly, so there was a, initially a brown diatom phase where everything got kind of coated with a, a light uh, brown diatom. That went away pretty quickly, and then this like bright green kind of encrust, not encrusting, but just uh, algae took over the rock for a couple of weeks, um, but a lot of urchins and a lot of snails. 
And you can see some of the Gorgonia now being placed back in the tank. So yeah, a lot of snails got employed, sea cucumbers. Uh, so this is a piece of Marco rock on the front ledge and that little purple dot was like, I was the happiest aquarist in the world when that started. And actually then someone pointed out it's shaped like a heart, which it is actually. So finally had some coralline algae starting to grow. So I was taking scrapings from other tanks and seeding the tank with some of the coralline algae. So this is the left side of the tank. So on the left side, I, I put some clams and some anemones up high with a, with a max spec LED spotlight on that spot. And then for the rest of the tank, I just really varied the lighting over time. Again, not putting too much on because I didn't want a huge algae problem, but I had to keep the corals alive that I was putting back in the tank. So it was a really, a, it was quite a, a delicate balance and dance going on. So here's one of the anemones on the top left of the tank. And uh, this is a little video, a little run. So you can see some in the background, some of the other coral colonies. So here comes a bunch of uh, Ocellaris clowns. These are captive bred by ORA. So a big emphasis on the tank is doing as much uh, captive bred fish as possible. The video takes a little while. I will guarantee they all do get down. Some of them are a little faster than the others. Uh, so again, this has the max spec LED over it to make sure that everything in that one spot gets plenty of light without putting too much light on the rest of the tank. And then just putting in, I forget what the, we used to call these, just like a yellow parazoanthus, uh, some anthelias, some soft corals. Uh, the first SPS coral were some Postalopores, just to see how they were doing. Um, there's some soft corals in the background there, as you can see. Uh, some Friedmanis from uh, ORA. And you see the sand had some brown diatom. This, it took a while for the sand to get, um, excuse me, took, took a while for the sand to get uh, active. Um, so this was my first dive in the new tank. And what was interesting was I always had a road map in my head of the tank. I could knew where I was all the time, but now that map had changed. So it was pretty interesting doing the dive and turning around and realizing I'm not where I thought I was. But the really cool thing was that when I got out of the tank, I went in to start doing my normal routine of leaving the mask on, getting over, toweling off, making sure no water dripped in my face because I was worried about the palethoa toxins. And then when I realized I don't have to do that anymore. Like, it was, I didn't realize what a, how heavy a burden that was of diving that tank with the palaeothoas, and now I didn't have to worry about it anymore. So that, that, was, a, that was a really good feeling. And so rethinking the fish population and everything else now, you can see the coral lines are starting to grow in a little better in this shot. So here's one of those um, um, style of four colonies that I had pruned back before bleaching. So this was all the dead skeleton underneath the live coral. If you look at the very top, you can see the frag plug. That was where the, that colony started, I don't know how many years ago. And that's about 40 pounds of calcium carbonate skeleton through the years. And then zip tying back on to the old skeleton, some of the stylos. So this was about a year ago. And this was two days ago. So th those are the colonies. You can still see the frag plug. Oh, still, it's almost getting covered now, but right dead center there. And this is a, at the bottom of the tank. So it's, under, it's about six feet of water. So the, these are growing on the bottom of the tank. But that's what would happen in nature. The big coral colony gets knocked over. Whatever is alive is going to survive and then grow back up to the light again. So it's, it's a pretty neat uh, effect. Uh, the, the front ledge of the tank and yes, there are some palaethoas back in the tank. So uh, the palaethoa grandis um, has a, I don't think has a very high toxic level. And I asked Julian, Julian Sprung, I don't know if you guys ever heard of him. He's a young up and comer down in Miami. I think he's gonna make a name for himself. But I was talking with Julian and he goes, I asked him about the palaethoa grandis and he goes, oh, I love them. I'm like, that wasn't the question. The question was, 
what do you think about them as far as toxicity and concern? He goes, yeah, I really love them. I'm like, I, I'm like well, you know, if one of your friends is dating someone who's really toxic to their relationship, but they love them, that's two different things. So there are Palithoa grandis in the tank. And the front ledge is kind of an homage to the early, uh, late, uh, mid-1980s reef keeping, a lot of soft corals, anemones. You can, this is all the Marco rock. Um, so you see the pink skunk clown. And then so to his left is actually a little baby Bangai cardinal fish. So they're breeding again in the tank. Um, so a lot of softies, mushrooms and things on the, on the front ledge. This is looking down. That pair of maroon clowns, I redid the clownfish tank as well. And part of that, these guys graduated to the big reef tank. Um, they've been together 26 years. So here's a, a, a new pump that Alex donated. This is the, the Abyss pump. And you can see the size of this thing. This thing moves 150,000 gallons per hour. Um, and uh, I actually have to reinforce the top of the tank before I can mount this thing. But Alex uh, at Abyss, they donated this to me, which is incredibly generous, because this is, this is basically a $20,000 pump. It looks like something that maybe fell off the, if any of you know, the SR-71 spy plane, that it reminds me of something that may have fell off of that. Um, so we talk about little gremlins and things that are, are that can be, hitting your tank and, you know, causing problems. So this is, this is the Sanjay gremlins hitting your tank at night. So you always want to be seeing what's going on within the tank. So for me, when I restarted the tank and, and I was dealing with some coral issues that looked like it was a bacterial and something, it turns out that it's, it may be new to science, lucky me, I'm not sure yet, but it's a white amphipod. This is not a great picture of it. This thing will eat any stony coral any stony coral, um, SPS, LPS, it's voracious. You can kill it with interceptor. It is susceptible to that. But again, I have a big tank. So what's interesting is I think these were in the tank before I even, before I broke it down, because where I was losing some corals, thinking it was bacterial or, um, you know, RTN or something like that, it was actually these guys because the way they eat the coral, and here's some in a very small fungia. So the larger white dots are the adults, but they have direct development and the babies are like fine grains of sand. And these are the worst things I've ever dealt with in my life, as if starting a, restarting a 20,000 gallon tank wasn't challenging enough and now dealing with these guys. So here's some Monty caps in a holding tank, and you look at them, and they are stressed out, and there's some tissue loss and everything else. That, that's, that's the amphipod. So when they get into a euphilia colony, you'll see the euphilia will, um, part of that, some of the heads will be closed up, and you'll see some like tissue just not happy, and then the, and then the tissue is gone. It looks like it's just rotting away. It's these guys. So um, that's what I think about them. Um, this goes back years ago when I first had acroweeding flatworms in the tank and I was dealing with them by hosing them off. Um, so I do, I do some of the hosing to get ahead of some of these amphipods also. Um, but I think what's been a tremendous help in when I reset the tank um, are the dragon face uh, pipefish. I don't know the Latin name, my apologies, but uh, the, I'm getting ahead of the reproductive curve of these amphipods. And I think these guys are also really helping hunting down the ones I can't get to. So some of the coral colonies I've had to take out that were growing well, they got infected, dip them in revive, it knocks them off, and then break up that colony and then replant it or put it into a different section of high flow. And so these, these amphipods have slowed down the progress of this tank of probably about over the last year. It probably put me back maybe three to five months worth of coral growth. And then I didn't want to introduce more corals to the tank because I didn't want them getting infected by this amphipod. But since doing these guys, me being the main predator on them also, and some smaller wrasses, the reinfection rate is way, way down. 
Um, so this is some of the tank now. This was just I uh, know this was a, this was a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is top down. So a lot of the corals that were replanted were planted as uh, as frags uh, and letting them grow into the, into the system. Uh, this is now the, the left side of the tank. Oops, I'm sorry. I thought there was video here. Um, and um, this is kind of a wide angle view of the right side of the tank. So that, that rock wall on your right side over there that had all the fiberglass rod and the uh, rock piled up uh, is what's happening over there. Um, so this is... This week was a really good week diving, um, and it's no big deal, but it is relative to this, was I was able to start fragging some of the frags that I had planted a year ago, or even less than a year ago. So there's some, like on the lower left, you'll see some gray epoxy. So I was able to frag off some of the stylos and replant them so that they'll all grow in around themselves, and I'll end up with a, what will look like a big colony in a shorter period of time. And we've been doing that since the 80s. Um, so there's a bunch of frags that were glued in there. Uh, here's another top-down shot of the right side of the tank. So this is about um, a, l a little over a year since the tank was drained and bleached. Oh, actually, you can see one of the pipefish kind of dead center at the top there. So a lot of the green stags, and so a lot of corals, not a lot. There were always some corals that I could never grow in this reef tank. Certain tanks just don't accept certain corals. It's just a thing. Um, so what's been really nice is the tanks now, the tank has accepted some corals that I wasn't able to grow in years past. So that's been very rewarding as well. So the whole right side is going to be planned that the whole, the whole lower right side um, is going to be all Monty Cap. So it'll just look like one huge uh, Monty Cap colony, which is what you would see in the wild. You'd see like these single large monospecific stands of corals. They become the dominant coral in that area. Uh, but yeah, some of the abro growth has been, has been really good. Oh, here's a, this will be a short video of the left side of the tank. So there's some turban areas. So this used to be a big, big stand of yellow turban areas. It was one of my favorite sections, and it slowly declined over the years. And again, I thought it was something bacterial or something, and I, and I come to realize it was probably those amphipods. They were just flying under the radar back then. Of course, they are so small. There's some Soho tanks. They're, they're about 18 years old now, 19 years old. There's a cool little frag rack up front there. So there's still a lot more corals to go in, still a lot more fish to go in. Just really taking it slow. Uh, this is the right side now. You can see that there's some good growth in. The green stags have been growing nice. There's a, making that into a nice wall of green singularia over there. Um, having that one section opened up, can, little lagoon area there. A lot of softies on the front ledge. So there's a list here. Um, you know, couldn't, couldn't have done it by myself, that's for sure. But um, it, it was a lot of hard work. The, got uh, a lot of nice corals uh, donated back to me from other public aquariums. So it's always good to share your corals because you can always call up your friend and get a piece back. And it looks like uh, Raj from MRC hacked my program because I would never write MRC that many times. So I think Raj hacked my program. Um, and the emotional support of Rich Ross and Ben Johnson, uh, their thoughts and prayers kept me going through the three, so it was three weeks, that renovation was done in three weeks. Um, and uh, it's, it's been a good rebirth on many levels of the tank and for myself, this is one of the snowy owls that I took a shot of last year and I thought he had some good attitude. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to 22 and growing a lot more corals. Uh, the system is run. If anybody has any questions, also during the show, if you see me, just, just come up and ask anything. We'll do a quick, I think we got time for a quick question and answer thing. The tank is run just on, not just Kalkwasser, but the, it's, I don't do any uh, calcium reactors. I don't do any two-part. It's only Kalkwasser, and a lot of people 
have kind of poo-pooed Kalkwasser. There may be people in this audience that haven't even heard of it as time has progressed. But this tank is run solely on Kalkwasser for, for calcium and alkalinity, which is, which is a, a fun thing to say. But that's, that's about all I got. So, but if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them here. And then if not, yeah. So the question was, how deep is the sand on the bottom? So um, at most, two inches. So I kept it very shallow. Uh, and if, the, if, you can't, if it can't be seen from the public, there's no sand. So I kept a lot of areas, just again, to, I don't like bare bottom tank. I know, it, I just don't like the appearance of it. Um, but so that sand does get vacuumed now. I was, and stirred, you know, stirred a couple times a week just to get detritus out of it. Um, but uh, yeah, so I was very cautious about having too much sand. And you know, you could have any discussion on deep sand beds. I mean, it, the talks are endless about it. But yeah, I, I wanted just an aesthetic, pretty much an aesthetic layer in there. Anything else? It's hard to see. Yeah, right. Up. The question was, is Long Island Aquarium AZA accredited? No, we, we're not AZA accredited. We do have other accreditations. We do have, you know, we have the USDA, APHIS. You know, we get inspected twice a year. They do our spot checks. Uh, the mammal department, I can't think of the different accreditations that they have, but we, we're not uh, AZA accredited. Anything else? I guess that's it. Well, thanks for listening again. If you have any questions at some point, definitely give me a shout.